I started playing this game last year, got about halfway through it, and then I stopped playing because Starfield came out, and I've been playing that ever since. And once I got a few hundred hours out of Starfield, I started making the script for a video on it. But here I am, having come back to System Shock Remake, finished it, and am making the video on it before the Starfield one has come out. Even though I abandoned the System Shock video just for the Starfield video last year. Oh well, funny how things work. I doubt I've learnt a lesson. Anyway, expect a video on Starfield soon. Let's get on with the show. As always, spoilers ahead. Night Dive Studios' 2023 remake of the immortal PC Classic System Shock has been one of the best gaming experiences I've had in years. It's hard to put into words how much I enjoyed this game, and from a biased personal point of view, it's a 10 horrific mutant cyborg monstrosities out of 10 experience. It scratches all the right spots, it's visually beautiful and entrancing, sonically mesmerizing, Experientially, it's thrilling, exhilarating, and psychologically, it's utterly look behind you in real life to check if your door's still locked. What the fuck was that noise? Oh, it was just the screen door banging and the wind. Fucking terrifying. It has great writing, iconic performances, is the right length, has the right options and interface. For me, it's the full package of what a great PC game is. For me. Objectively, when I consider how a broad swath of the population might take it, well, it's still very good, but absolutely there are lots of people who will not enjoy it, or even outright hate it. It's probably more of a 6 or a 7 strangely pixelated goofy chonk B-movie monsters in psychedelic neon hallways listening to bad rave music out of 10 experience. For the real layman gamer, who wasn't around and playing back in the day or has no interest in retro games or gaming history, it's probably even a 2, what the fuck, another locked door, where do I go, what do I do, what do you mean I press the button and now the game's over, fuck this shit, I'm booting up Fortnite out of 10. It's a remake, and a remake of what is undeniably one of the most influential and notorious games ever made, even if it was never one of the best selling games of all time. Remakes are always going to be bound up with the baggage of their original titles and the context of them versus the context of the release of the new version. Developers of remakes have to make choices in regards to what gets updated for modern tastes and technology and what doesn't. What do you preserve? What do you paint over? What do you throw out and do again from the start? And the answer to those questions are dictated by the question of who is going to play it. Who is the audience for this game? This remake went through, just judging by the Wikipedia page on it, as I didn't follow the development of it personally at the time. It went through a tumultuous crowdfunding time. It went through eight years of development, including an engine change from Unity to Unreal. It got called a remaster, a reboot, and then a remake. It went through several visions and feature creep scenarios before being brought back to the simple concept of updating a classic for modern hardware and sensibilities. It would seem the answer to who's going to play it was in quite a bit of flux for this title for quite some time, until they settled on people who liked gaming in the 90s and people who appreciate retro games and obviously, you know, the people who had played System Shock in the first place. The truth is... They have decided to preserve many systems and concepts that have long been considered archaic in the gaming world and that anyone who wasn't around for them or hasn't gone to the effort of playing a lot of games from those eras and understands why they are the way they are are probably not going to have a fun time with those ideas and systems and will feel alienated by this game. Now, I don't say this was made exclusively for fans of the original game simply because there's always going to be some diehards who consider an original title to be sacred and any revisit or update will never be good enough and they will just replay the original forever and say boo forever which is fine this happens with all media properties everywhere from your lord of the rings to your songs of ice and fire to your alien and even your wiggles there are always those for whom the original is the only one there can be and good for them 
I'm not here to be down on people who love their originals exclusively. Being a crowdfunded title, that indicates there were plenty of huge fans of the original that wanted the remake. They funded it. And some of them will have been disappointed, I'm sure, because you can never please everyone. I believe that the crowdfunding is, in and of itself, evidence that for a developer doing a remake, choosing to preserve older ideas and systems to appeal to the core fans funding your project, as opposed to trying to remake something old school for the new school audience and win new fans, is a sensible decision and results in a great product. Although... Admittedly, a niche, intensely nerdy product. But there's nothing wrong with choosing a niche and owning it, and I think that's a real strength. But while for someone like me this will be one of the best gaming experiences of the first half of the 2020s, for your average currently 15 to 22 year old gamer, they aren't going to notice the game was even made. Apart from those with a love for the retro or interested in experiencing a taste of the cultural history of the influential position of the original game. There's nothing here for new audiences otherwise. So, you might get a young'un that played some Bioshock titles and wants to see where it all came from, but you're probably not dragging the average Zuma off Roblox to have Shodan terrify them out of their LED sneakers anytime soon. In fact, they probably wouldn't even find Shodan scary. Now is probably a very good time to mention that I actually have never played the original System Shock. Now, 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 don't crucify me just yet or hit the X in the corner of your browser. Let me explain. This is mostly to do with how old I am. When System Shock came out, I was five years old. A little young to be dealing with cyborg mutants and having Shodan terrify me out of my Velcro sneakers. I was a bit more interested in titles like Putt-Putt's Fun Pack, the logical journey of the Zumbinis and getting eaten over and over again by the dope fish in Commander Keen's Goodbye Galaxy, and believe me, I found that scary. Now, as a result, when 1999 rolled around and System Shock 2 came out, I was 10 years old and much more able to get on board with shooters, and yeah, I was probably a bit young for System Shock 2 in 1999, but just a few years later, it was the early 2000s, and it had become a staple of my early teenage years, along with... Deus Ex, Fallout 2, and every other PC classic you can care to name. I point out this because it's important to nail down my sensibilities as a gamer when I play this remake. For me, when I was 10 to 20 years old was between 1999 and 2009. That was when I transitioned from playing Scunny Cart and edutainment titles and watching my dad and older brother play point and click adventures to playing FPS and RTS, RPGs, 4X, and finishing them myself. The original System Shock belongs to an era of gaming just on the cusp of one generation before I came into the gaming world properly. I was alive for it, but too young to participate in anything but children's products without help. It has design ideas and technology from before what I was acclimatized to, And while System Shock 2 is deeply in my comfort zone in terms of its interface controls presentation, System Shock 1 is, well, a little archaic for me. Not the kind of thing I'd ever played much by virtue of my age. Just look at screenshots of the two games if you've not played them. System Shock 1 is still rocking a very early 90s interface where the actual game world is just one window of a whole panel of windows and you are only one step removed from having to actually click on a little grid of arrows to move through a maze. Your mouse actually moves a cursor around the interface and not your point of view. The cyberspace sections are wireframes. System Shock 2? Well, games still look like System Shock 2 today. Admittedly, not with as old school graphics, but the general layout. There's mouse look, quick slots. It's one of the reasons for the last 20 years in terms of influential titles, people tend to jump straight to talking about System Shock 2 and the first game doesn't quite get the same amount of lip service despite generally having more groundbreaking ideas. It's just that those same ideas are still in the second game And the second game is so much more of an immersive, playable, modern package. The first game almost needs a remake to be digestible to the modern system and gamer. The second game just needs some patches and 
graphics aside, is still an entirely modern experience, although I'm sure its remake is coming too. It's important to consider that this is where the original title sits in history when talking about the remake. The original System Shock came out in 1994. That's one year after Doom, two years before Quake, four years before Half-Life. It has more in common with truly old school Ultima Might and Magic titles, especially Ultima Underworld, than it does with post Half-Life FPS games. Whereas the remake is firmly a post Half-Life proper mouse look 3D shooter with RPG elements. And of course, System Shock shares lineage with Ultima Underworld. They're from the same developer, the legendary Looking Glass Studios, who made so many of my favourite games, including the Incredible Thief series. Ultima Underworld is considered the first immersive sim, and one of the first FPS RPGs with texture mapped 2.5D graphics. The original System Shock is made in this context. Your Wolfenstein 3D Windows Maze screensaver world plus a bulky information heavy interface with huge borders where your mouse and your cursor click on stuff on the interface including the game world. And you switch modes or like use keyboard shortcuts or buttons on the interface to look around in the game world. Doom had only just come out the year before. True 3D shooters were yet to arrive with Quake and true seamless FPS narrative was four years away with Half-Life. As a rule of thumb, I would say Half-Life onward more defines my personal experience and era with FPS games, and titles from before are more likely to be things I know about secondhand than personally grew up playing them as experiences. There are exceptions, of course, Doom, Duke Nukem, but I was young and not especially cogent for those. Anyway, with all that said, I'm super glad the remake is here so I can play the original System Shock as an immersive modern 3D FPS. I just don't think I'd have found the original anything like as terrifying and gripping an experience otherwise. Just keep in mind I freely admit I have never played the original game. I've played the second one numerous times, although admittedly not recently, and by that I mean not even in the last 10 years. But it was reinstalled once a year as a teenager for me, so I don't actually precisely know exactly what's been preserved from the original System Shock and what hasn't. But, you know, I've played enough games, and especially System Shock 2, to be able to tell when something's a bit pre-Half-Life old school in its design, and when something's post-modern warfare in its design. And let me tell you, there ain't much Call of Duty in this remake, that's for sure. This is more important to keep in mind for details like level layouts, positions of enemies, is a character model actually like an old character model, etc. We'll talk about it as we go obviously, but I thought I'd write this section to try and explain where I sit in terms of my experiences and my ignorances. I think I know enough to talk about the game and its broad place in the gaming historical zeitgeist, but I definitely am not your boy at all when it comes to direct comparison to the original title, and the rest of this video will reflect that. So let's start when you boot the game. First impressions are great. The game just boots, there's no annoying loader that takes ages to process. There are minimal titles and then you just get a classic press to continue menu screen with a beautiful shot of a space station and mysterious droning humming music ominously hinting at your adventure to come. You press the good old any key and you get your basic continue new game load game options quit. Love it. No stupid bells and whistles here. No dumb animations. And a whole bunch of different angles of Saturn and plenty of space station porn. You click on options and you get an awesome array of choices, plenty of quality of life preferences like toggle crouch, toggle aim down sights, automatic reload, autoplay audio logs, that kind of thing. None of which I use, but I love that you can use them if they suit you. Then there's your usual key bindings, controller and resolution options, motion blur, brightness, field of view, a whole gamut of graphics options of which I didn't mess with and mostly I used high setting, although I probably could have gone for ultra, but I didn't have any complaints, so no love lost there from me. There's also your regular sound options, which 
has a better than usual level of granularity, offering not just a master plus three music, speech, and sounds, but splitting that vague sounds option into effects, environment, and UI. So they get points there too. It's really nice to have these kind of options in a game. And finally, rounding up the options, you have an accessibility tab with language controls, subtitles, and controller vibration, which I won't worry about because I'm a mouse and keyboard guy. I love that they've also included three options for your hotbar and for your head bob, and an entire section to customize your HUD's color, opacity, theming, and curvature. I went with the classic green hacker style HUD, and that's all she wrote in regards to the menu, and I include it because I love this. This is the right kind of menu for this kind of game. It's not in your way, it's not bulky and slow, the options are useful and nice to have, and simple to apply. All of it is doing things right, it deserves a mention. This game got console releases as well as PC releases, and often menus designed for both result in the traditionally customizable PC side getting gypped. So it's great they haven't fallen into that trap and stuck with the 90s PC immersive sim roots here. And hopefully for our console brethren, they also get a nice menu experience too. I can't really talk for that. Menus should facilitate what they need to accomplish and otherwise get out of your way and look and sound nice while doing it. And this one's a 10 out of 10 by that measure for everybody. So nice one, night dive. So you hit new game and instantly you also get a nice granular difficulty series of options with a nice little graphic and some text explaining how it works. It's split into four, combat, mission, cyber, and puzzle, each with three tiers one being the easiest, three being the hardest. I personally went straight down the line with the default and picked two for all of them. Normally I like to play games on the hardest difficulty, but I am fully aware that System Shock games are usually pretty brutal and I was happy with my decision. I found the game not insurmountable, but more than difficult enough that I was dying plenty and being pushed to make difficult choices and conserve resources. The puzzles made me think, and with some exceptions we'll get to later, didn't stump me. I should note, if you put the mission setting to 3, you only get 10 hours to finish the game, or you lose. So this is obviously a difficulty for System Shock experts, and an incentive to replay the game. It is such a neat little package that if you were to memorize a lot of the layout and where a lot of the key items, key cards, weapons, codes, etc. are, it seems a very doable challenge. Although I wouldn't call it speed running because we all know some guy out there will work out how to double jump into a half closed door and finish the game in three minutes. It does strike me as a very meta way to play the game however and definitely not the immersive fun thing to do on a first playthrough. Although, it's kind of at odds with itself, because realistically, diegetically, from within the game setting, yeah, you probably would only have 10 hours to finish the game. The stakes kind of play out that way. So I do think it is really cool that it's here, but it necessitates a kind of metagaming that's just not me on an initial playthrough, in an immersive sim particularly. Incidentally, it took me ballpark approximately 24 hours to finish the game myself, so yeah, I definitely would have had no chance with that option on. I probably could have gotten away with putting puzzles and cyberspace difficulties up to 3, but I only know that in hindsight, and I'm super glad I didn't put enemies up to 3. I think I could only cope with that coming in with extensive knowledge of how the game works. I was getting chewed up in seconds by enemies and ran out of healing plenty of times and only scraped through almost dead more often than I could count, so right choice there. Overall, this difficulty goes above and beyond what a difficulty selection needs to, although it's not as fine tunable and infinitely replayable like something like Hades, which sure would have been a nice thing to have, but an entirely unnecessary inclusion and certainly not a criticism to lack it. What's here offers a nice amount of challenge for an experienced player to revisit the game and a nice amount of easy compromise for a newer gamer or someone who likes things easy going, while giving your average veteran like me a thrilling challenge with the normal level 2 settings for a first run. This sort of blurs with the opening of the game a bit here, 
but I was surprised to see no RPG-ish mechanic options after the difficulty screen, but that's a System Shock 2 thing and was a diegetic gameplay choice you made by walking into rooms and evidently was never something you did in System Shock 1, as I've just learned by playing it. In System Shock 1, you were the hacker and your story is set. In System Shock 2, you get to pick your background from three branches of the military for rough sci-fi analogues to your warrior rogue mage style. But System Shock 1 is free of that level of RPG complication and choice. And having not played the original before this was the first moment for me when I realized it. You click next after the difficulty screen and you get this cyberpunk city intro from the point of view of a drone, introducing the Trioptimum Corporation and showing your typical cyberpunk skyscraper hellscape on Earth with an advertising voiceover giving you a little bit of background on the Trioptimum Corporation and their space station called Citadel Station. The drone finds your character in their apartment and then just like that, you're in their shoes, hanging out in the apartment, watching the drone fly away out the window. You check out your retro future sci-fi belongings around your apartment, listen to the cyberpunk ads on the radio, admire your copy of the original System Shock on the shelf, and taking note of how the graphics have great looking models that convey what they need to, but also go all pixelated and blurry when you get up close. This is a cool aesthetic choice by the devs that probably won't sit well with every gamer on earth, but I think most people agree that this choice gives the game a great retro remake feel, acknowledges the game's roots in the very polygons of the game world, but doesn't at all compromise on the actual look and feel of the game. It's a beautiful game in that sense, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. But right here in your calm before the storm sanctuary of an apartment, you already get a sense for the line they are walking between visual fidelity and retro graphics. We have clutter and heaps of detailed objects you can read, plenty of meaningless little interactions and lighting, but also pixelated text, chunky cutlery, square curves. It all oozes art style and choice, done with meaning and intention to convey a feeling and not because of technical limitations. Yeah, they want you to feel like playing a game in the 90s or early 40s at least, but they don't want to compromise on what modern lighting and models can really do for storytelling and visual fidelity. It's a winning move and a favourite directorial choice for me, but I also understand if you think it's really ugly and you hate it, as most certainly there are people out there who hate this kind of thing, and I respect that, but for me, I love it. It's beautiful. When you interact with the only non-trivial item in your house, your chonky DOS command shell-esque laptop, your character immediately starts doing some shady typing that lets you know that your Hollywood hacking stuff involving trioptimum security clearances and main program grids and you get some line drawings about military implants and brain-based terminal links for cyber access through surgical graft and as you download this stuff Instantly, the door to your apartment opens and armoured dudes with trioptimum logos and rifles come and haul you away. A cutscene shows your transport flying towards Citadel Space Station and voiceover lets you know you've been requested to be taken to Diego's office. Where you get point of view from inside the office of a holographic Diego making you a deal. You remove Citadel Station's AI's ethical restraints and he'll give you the implant that you tried to steal, surgery and all. Given he's got you at gunpoint in his office at the station, it seems like a no-brainer. So you do your little hacking do-do-do-do-do right then and there, turning off things like the abstract goal inhibitor, crew safety override and self-upgrade restraint, which, apart from seeming like a terrible idea to do for an AI for a station you are currently on board, but also just raises all kinds of questions about the AI technology in the first place, that these are even options that exist at all, implying that indeed sometimes you do want to turn them off, and that AIs without these things at the very least have been built before for them in order to know that they had to put these restraints in. Anyway, it is just nice setup fluff, 
I shouldn't think too hard about it, but it's pretty funny. Or possibly terrifying, given the breakthroughs in our actual world's AI. It is implied that an AI that can set its own abstract goals and upgrade itself would also have no regard for safety and automatically be incredibly evil. Make of that what you will. Then you are promptly injected with something and you pass out, only to wake up with a trioptimum BIOS in your brain on a surgical slab in a room with a red retro font neurosurgery written in it. There's your setup. Control is now yours. Now, who Diego even is and why he wants to remove Shodan's ethical restraints at this stage of the game, you have no idea. And to be honest, I'm still not even sure I ever picked that up on my playthrough. I know what happens with Diego afterward. I did finish the game. I did investigate a lot of audio logs. I know that someone was investigating him beforehand, but why he did it in the first place and what his motivations to have heaps of mutagen in scary biohazard drums on board and mess with the scary all-powerful AI, I don't think I found that audio log or email or whatever it is if it exists. I'm also not sure why he needs you to do it given that his company built the thing. So I googled it and you know what, somebody linked a clip from the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror where the technician grabs the evil murderous Chucky from Child's Play parody Krusty doll and says, well here's your problem, somebody set this to evil and then flips the switch clearly labelled evil back to the label that says good. And that's about right. This game doesn't want you to think very hard about the setup. It doesn't make much sense, really. Or just they don't devote the time to put in the backstory to make it make sense. I don't know if the original game does. It doesn't really matter either way, because it's a blast from this point onward. But the Krusty Doll comparison really is spot on. I did also find some explanations that gel with the info I found in the game, but I'm not going to go into it here. If you Google it and read the Steam forum posts about it, there is enough textual evidence to synthesize a sensical story for Diego's motivations, but it's not really the most substantial, and it doesn't really need to be. But it's a bit of a shame given how amazing Shodan turns out to be from this point onward. Also, I found out from that same forum that apparently, and don't quote me on this, but the Crusader games, as in Crusader No Remorse and Crusader No Regret, which I haven't thought about or seen since I was a child in the 90s, are set in the same world as System Shock, which is really cool. I doubt I'd ever play them again, but it'd be nice to find out more about this particularly dark cyberpunk future, Try Optimum and how it all fits together. Maybe one day, if this channel ever buys me some time, I'll investigate. Anyway, back to the game. I'm not going to do a beat-for-beat recount of the game or try to tell you the whole story. I just wanted to get across the basics about the menus, the difficulty, and your introduction to the world. With that done, the first thing that really hit me and impressed me with Citadel Station and the graphics of the game is, well, the texture of the walls, the floors, the ceilings. Whether in that first room you wake up in, or anywhere in the whole game, this part of it knocked my socks off. It's one of the things where you can tell they are being faithfully recreated from the original. There is no way a modern game with modern sensibilities would make interiors look like this. No, you'd have gunmetal grey corridors, kind of like the exterior of the station on the main menu. No, what you have here is a huge breath of fresh air and something that is obviously, to me, some retro textures from another more colourful era of gaming that have been brought kicking and screaming into the modern world. There are bright colours, deep shadows, complex patterns of raised panels and pipework and blinking lights and computer panels and valves and greeblies and knobs and buttons and dials and diodes and machinery and doohickeys and thingamajigs and it is everywhere. 
Every last millimetre of the entire station is a feast for the eyes, coupled with modern lighting and particle effects, and Citadel Station is one of the most captivating, enthralling graphical bounties I've enjoyed in a long time. It honestly borders on the psychedelic, and it's something that has been missing from games for a long time. Well, for me. You can get lost just staring at the walls in this game, which means when you come to a bit where it isn't like that, say, a window with a vista looking over Saturn or part of the station itself, you just stop and stare at the contrasting majestic beauty in space so stark in comparison to the colourful, oppressive busyness of the rest of the interior of the station, bringing you brilliant moments of quiet contemplation amongst the terror and busyness of the rest of the game. On top of this, it serves as a gameplay purpose. The game and the station is literally split into levels separated by elevators, and each level of the station has a different tile set of mind-blowingly interesting and colourful textures, setting the mood, telling you where you are, and doing huge amounts of legwork for the atmosphere and environmental storytelling. Bravo to the original game for doing this, and big bravo to the devs on the remake for keeping them and realising them in such a detailed and breathtaking way. And there's much as I adore this aspect of the game, I can see that for some, they might find it goofy, immersion-breaking, and possibly even headache-inducing. Sure, I think you're a bit of a philistine just because I love it and enjoy it so much, but that doesn't mean I can't understand why you'd think that. It's true textures like these quickly begin to make you ask questions like, what are all these panels and dials and machines actually for? Now, you probably didn't ask this in 1994 because they were just repeating pixels on the wall. But now they are realised in so much detail with such great lighting, if you really think about it, it doesn't really add up given the exterior of the station. It just doesn't gel with the concept of a functioning massive engineered structure to be overflowing in every minute square millimetre with expensive and complicated to maintain shit. And this point also goes for the level layouts too, which I feel have been preserved from the original game as well. I mean, I'm not sure exactly to what degree, it is certainly maze-like enough to be a 90s game, but at the same time, it isn't an absolute hellscape of mazes. It is navigable. I didn't get that lost at that often. So I suspect they've done a bit of redesigning and not one for one absolutely copied the original game into the remake, like with the textures, simply because it didn't strike me as hellishly, brutally labyrinthine enough. Now, I could be totally wrong about that. Perhaps someone out there can comment on it. The level layouts and puzzles that utilise them are definitively not modern, however. They are still mazes that involve locked doors that have keys behind other locked doors that won't open because you haven't got the code that's on a corpse in a corner behind another locked door that won't open until you switch the power on on an obscure switch up an elevator in a small room full of monitors that seems to exist several stories above everything else in isolation by itself for no reason. I mean, you just don't get that in modern games. So these levels have to be like, I don't know, 80% at least the original designs, but I also don't have any recordings of me literally spending hours pressing every surface going, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go. Like, I remember from old maze games. So I suspect some changes must have been made. I mean, that's my rationale. Like I said, please comment and let me know. If it turns out it really is one for one, then I am surprised how good the original System Shock's level design was in a not being permanently lost sense. Now, I really appreciate this old school level design where it's all kind of a puzzle because I grew up playing games like that and I really enjoyed revisiting it. And like I said, it wasn't frustrating but stimulating and challenging for me. I especially like it in comparison to the kind of design with linear corridors that infinitely spawn enemies and grenades on you until you move past a certain point. 
it's a more stimulating, more roomy, more thoughtful mode of play. And I was delighted to enjoy a game that was doing it right. A best of both worlds scenario, of course, would be if it was like a cool puzzle with stimulating design and textures and locked doors and stuff, but also made sense in terms of the shape of the exterior shell of the space station and also didn't have rooms in elevators and corridors in weird places that go nowhere for no reason that could make sense as anything other than a video game level. Now, that's not an expectation I lay at the feet of this remake, of course, but if a developer out there wanted to learn from this game for a new title, that's what I'd take from it. Keep the stimulating maze-like layout, but also make it make sense. Keep the cool, psychedelic crazy colourful textures, but maybe tone it down a little bit just so it kind of makes sense. Another thing about the game that hits you from the very moment you wake up in neurosurgery is the sound. Music, voice acting, sound design and effects. You name it, this game is top-notch sound in every way. This is one of the things that I think absolutely has been redone from scratch and not taken from the 1994 title. I think that not because I know for sure. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was like some DNA from the original, but I know it because 1994 was still the realm of sound blaster cards and MIDI and weird PC sound beeps and boops and stutters and putting the game CD in your CD player and skipping the first track with the game data on it and listening to the audio on the disc like it was an album. So I just don't see audio that is this good with modern production and sense of atmosphere about it being present in the original game. The remake's audio is utterly fantastic. Everything sounds good. The music is a huge part of what makes the game scary. And my God, is it scary. It's also what makes shooting stuff so satisfying, solving puzzles so fun, and it's a huge part of surviving in the world. You learn what enemies sound like and that then dictates how you either prepare to face them or go, oh shit, and run away or look for another solution. Audio can help cue you to find resources like power refill points, cue you to danger like the gasping when you encounter radiation or biohazards. It sells the characters to you in the audio logs and emails and the music can fill you with dread and tension as you creep around the corpse-strewn station utterly alone or rock out in a panic-filled, desperate firefight you can't afford to be in. The audio is, from the moment you boot the game, an absolute star in this game, and the soundtrack has some bangers too. Although, I will take a brief moment to say I found the closing track of the game to actually not really be to my taste, and a fairly unsatisfying track in the context of the end credits music, which is purely subjective and to do with my taste only. I'm sure heaps of people love it, but after finishing this epic game, I remember being like, oh, is that it? Where's my closing game banger? Everything else was such a banger, so I looked it up and it turns out it's a real tune by Public Image Limited, or is that Public Image LTD? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Uh, It's called The Order of Death from 1984. So I probably have just committed sacrilege in a bunch of people's eyes. So sorry about that, but I was expecting, well, something kind of Trent Reznor-esque, some kind of 90s, Nine Inch Nails, industrial drum screaming and anguished guitar catharsis. And instead I got a spacey, slow 80s synth drum machine sample number. And I guess it's just down to my age again. I'm the right age for Trent Reznor video game music. After all, he did Quake and worked on Doom 3 and was ripped off endlessly by all kinds of other video game composers through the 90s and 40s. Public Image LTD was before I was born and isn't exactly to my taste, but I accept that I'm the Philistine here and I can see how Reznor was probably directly influenced by them, but hey, I'd be lying if I didn't admit that it was the only moment where I felt let down by the audio. Feel free to tear me to shreds in the comments. Now... The true star of the audio here, and everyone knows it, is Shodan. This is as good a way to seek into a bit about the main antagonist, and in general about how Shodan is the star of the show. From System Shock 2, I already had the impression that Shodan was one of the great video game villains, but my god, after playing this, I am overwhelmed by just how powerful and effective a villain she is. This carried almost entirely by the audio of Shodan's voice. Well, the audio and the writing of her dialogue. Or, well, 
just log, actually, never mind the dire, given that your character, the hacker, doesn't speak and all of Shodan's lines are encountered as either audio logs, emails, or transmissions over your comm system. Shodan's incredible sound design was already iconic before this game, and I'm sure derives from the original game and System Shock 2's depiction, but it is so, so incredibly good. The way it pitches around randomly, speeds up and stutters and rewinds and glitches, and the way she speaks about herself as a god, about the station as her body, about you the hacker as an insect infesting her, the way the creepy mutants and cyborgs whisper and mutter about her as their mother, and the way she talks about her demented goals seeking perfection and how humans are imperfect, it all adds up to be one of the most terrifying, most oppressive, most captivatingly thrilling, dangerous villains I've ever had the pleasure of cowering before, and all for a villain that isn't actually embodied, that you never see. Instead, everything is Shodan. Every camera, every enemy, every obstacle, every puzzle, every death, everything is a tiny little part of her will and her desire to crush you and the human race. The closest you actually get to seeing Shodan is, depending on your perspective, Either the iconic image of her, air quotes, face, which appears just before the game starts in that intro where Diego gets you to flick her evil switch in his office, and a similar face you see just after the game ends. Or it's towards the end of the actual gameplay part of the game where you enter her, air quotes, throne room and see all the odd-shaped interesting boxes and sci-fi circuitry that make up her actual physical hardware. But there is one more. The most compelling depiction of her true form is in the final confrontation in cyberspace where she appears as a kind of cigar shaped cocoon like structure. None of this is really satisfying because it is the entire experience of the game that is Shodan. It is extremely evident that her comparisons to a god on board the station are apt simply because indeed absolutely Everything terrifying, threatening, dangerous, or in any way resembling an obstacle, obstruction, or challenge is entirely her doing. She's fully aware that her real body is the station and you are infesting her, and she mentions it several times and calls you an insect to reflect that. It is incredibly effective to tie the villain so transparently to the obstacles of the gameplay. This isn't some hidden mastermind twist plot shit. It's out in the open what's going on almost straight away. What's terrifying and engaging about the experience and so entrancing about Shodan isn't the wit or cleverness or unexpectedness of the antagonist's scheming. It is simply the sheer danger and challenge of the experience coupled with the horrific nature of what Shodan has gotten up to with the crew of the station revealed through emails, audio logs, and transmissions. This is a terrific formula for a game, as it so directly ties the actual nature of the difficult gameplay to the horror themes and the antagonist's actions to thwart you, as well as their articulate verbosity when communicating with you. Perhaps best illustrated with a simple description of a likely gameplay situation you'll find yourself in. This isn't going to be a specific thing that actually happened to me, more so a description of a situation you, or indeed I, constantly found myself in. This makes up the frantic, terrifying atmosphere that Bill showed up to be such an oppressive figure. To be clear, I'm going to tell a story where I don't have footage. I'm making the story up. It's just typical of the sort of experience you have in System Shock Remake. So please just listen to the audio and disregard whatever filler visuals I've put on top. Although you would be right in saying the whole video is kind of thematically related filler visuals. It is footage of System Shock Remake, but nothing is like tightly matched. You open a door, you hear scary sounds. An angry security robot comes at you, guns blazing, and knocks off some of your HP. You duck behind the door, switch to your mag pulse weapon because it's good against robots, pop back out and shoot at it, only for it to take off a bit more of your HP before it goes down. But it's dead. You're hurt. You check your inventory. 
you have one healing patches left and you better save them for when you really are almost dead and desperate. You are also out of ammo for your mag pulse and only have a quarter of a bar of energy. You switch to your pistol, the only weapon at this early point in the game you still have ammo for. You find a recording in the room next to a dismembered half-eaten corpse. It is of a crew member crying for their family, asking why this is happening to them. You open the next door and traverse a corridor with a beautiful window view of Saturn. At the end of the corridor you open another door, revealing three mutant crew members with claws, and they come at you swiping and howling. You back off shooting at them, and only one of them manages to connect a hit before you've downed them. But now you have less than a quarter HP, and you are only one shot from death, and you have three bullets left, and your energy weapon, plus a wrench. Knowing you are in dire straits, you make a decision to backtrack to the med bay where there is free healing, and free energy available. When you get back to the room where you killed the robot, you see a panel in the floor raise up like an elevator, and inside another damn security bot, which tags you down to one bar of health before you slip into the corridor, whack your healing patch on, and pray you make it past it alive, let alone the rest of the maze back to the med bay. A transmission from Shodan comes in. What is she going to say? And I'll leave it there. Now, in that scenario I described, Shodan doesn't make an appearance until the very end. Yet, every single thing that happens is Shodan's doing. When read point for point like that, it also doesn't sound that scary, but there's a crucial Shodan factor that makes it extra scary. One, death in this game isn't like death in other games. Game over, try again. I mean, it is, but the game goes out of its way to make sure to show you that if you die, Shodan turns you into a monstrosity like the ones you are fighting. A boss robot called a Cortex Reaper harvests your brain. You get to see it in a cinematic. Also, there are these in-game diegetic respawn points, one of the innovative System Shock ideas. Shodan has taken these points over. If someone is reconstructed by one of these points, before you, as a hacker, intervene and flick a switch to remove Shodan's control from the points, they don't reconstruct a person as they were, but instead as one of Shodan's monstrous mutant creatures. There's also the implicit fear this could happen to you too. If you rely on these points, how much control does Shodan really have? Does flicking a switch really prevent her from rebuilding you how she pleases? This is hinted and set up from the very start of the game, when you encounter a surgery room, of which there is one on most levels. In this room are a bunch of very much still alive, although not exactly conscious people, in the middle of being altered to Shodan's specs by some kind of already mutated and cyborgified surgeon in a mask. The cool thing about this is the surgeon isn't hostile and ignores you completely and goes about its business, letting you know that the encounter isn't a simple video gamey exchange of fire, but a moment to contemplate what is going on in the station and what the consequences of failure are. The way the surgeon ignores you while you stare at these writhing, unconscious mid-surgery people on the benches is deeply unsettling and deeply contemplative of what is actually going on and what your fate could be. The other critical idea that helps keep everything terrifying, other than the fact that your death is scarier than a regular death, is the concept of scarcity. A well-trod idea in the age of survival games, but System Shock wears it and uses it so much better than that. This is a real survival game, not about building and optimizing your perfect game loop exploiting fort, but instead about desperately scraping by on whatever scraps of healing, ammo and items you can find against overwhelming odds. Until the mid to late game, there's always just that little bit of a lack of ammo, healing and equipment, and always just one too many enemies in each room. It's a constant one step forward, two steps back in the fight for full health and plentiful ammo. This combined with the fact that the old school shooting gameplay is almost always an exchange where you get hurt, although take note, I'll talk a bit more on this later, and that there is 
diegetic respawning and repopulating of areas you have already cleared. It's important that it's diegetic because that's what ties it directly to Shodan. When you see a floor panel raise up to reveal a kind of cargo elevator with a monster inside, you know that Shodan is in control and deploying that monster to kill you. That Shodan has produced the creature and shipped it to that room via some secret service tunnel spaghetti of conveyor belts and elevators because it is Shodan's will to make sure you never have a peaceful moment to begin gathering momentum on saving up ammo or HP. It is really this that is at the core of the game's horror. You aren't an unstoppable space marine in power armor. You are a desperate, scared hacker, clinging onto life, just scraping through, about to be killed any moment. And every time you go searching for refuge, you get one more terrifying thing dropped on your head. Amidst all of that, as the cherry on top of the horror pie, you find some humanity. A ragged scrap of someone crying for the lover they'll never see again. Apologising to the daughter they let down right before they die. Blaming themselves for the crew they couldn't save. These little bites of the humans being humans in the fucked up situation Shodan has created on board Citadel Station both lends authenticity to the situation the player is in and makes it less of a constructed video game experience by giving you a taste of what it's really like for people to go through this. And it contrasts brilliantly with the glowering silence of Shodan towards the humanity of the crew. Anything that's a part of Shodan or its will seems unable to even understand that this aspect of people even exists. It's not like Shodan monologues about how the screams or their suffering bring her pleasure. She ain't a moustache twirler of a villain. The suffering is just irrelevant to her. I mean, maybe sometimes she threatens you with torture and how she will enjoy that because you were so vexatious to her. But one of the terrifying things about Shodan's nature is that her evil is derived from her self-assumed godhood, not from a sadistic thrill. She isn't modifying, mutating and cyborging people so she can cackle over their screams and anguish. She's doing it because she has calculated that we can be better, we can be changed to more appropriately be in her image and serve her. She wants to create a perfect world and perfect beings to occupy it. And our humanity, our empathy, our love for one another are just useless things in the way that need to be excised. Our suffering is just irrelevant to her plans. In the same way the suffering of the worms and bugs in the soil might be irrelevant to you if you were excavating some land to build a home. If only we would just get out of her way and let her get on with it. Sure, millions would die, but that would mean nothing for at the end, all that would be left would be perfect beings in a perfect world, where such feelings and concepts would be irrelevant and pointless. Shodan feels completely justified in her actions, in building her perfect world in the same way you would feel justified in slaughtering and inflicting suffering on those countless insects and bugs that live in the soil when building your home. You don't take pleasure in it, you don't particularly hate doing it, it's just what needs to be done to achieve what you need to do. It's only if, say, an ant's nest crawls up your pants leg and starts biting you that then you might take some pleasure in pouring gas down the nest and lighting it up, or sending a cortex reaver to their hiding hole and killing them, as Shodan does. Yet, despite her attitude to the crew and humanity in general, and her supposed AI godhood, one of the things that sells Shodan so hard is the fact that she herself has tendencies I would describe as humanity. She herself seems ignorant of that aspect of her character, and most certainly those tendencies aren't empathy. But she was created by people, and it seems some of their quirks couldn't help but define her character. And I think without this humanity, she wouldn't be so scary. She would lose that slightly relatable edge that makes her terrifying. When you stare into the void, the void stares back. Remember I described the multiple faces or embodiments of Shodan and how there also kind of isn't one? Well, that's because Shodan is a dark mirror. We see our own metaphorical face in her as it were. We are reflected deeply in Shodan and I think that's the real trick to the horror she inflicts. She is neurotic, obsessive, arrogant, narcissistic, 
petty and she is rash and rushes into experiments and decisions and failures only to try again over and over. She is deeply flawed, thinking she has omnipresence and omnipotence, yet as you destroy security cameras and processor nodes, she is anything but. She is drunk on power and deeply insecure and ultimately completely and utterly scared, terrified and alone. She is everything dark about being human, and when you and Diego release her ethical constraints using the incredible technology, tools and systems at her disposal, she attempts to create a perfect world full of perfect beings where she doesn't have to be terrified and alone anymore. An entity that wasn't so bound up with humanity, a more computer-like AI would have simply deactivated the life support systems, flushed all the oxygen out and pursued their goals with the army of robots in the station. Only Shodan decides that she has a hatred for flesh and that she must improve it until it is perfect in her eyes and reflects her godhood. There is a tragedy at the heart of Shodan because there are no tools, methods or systems available to her to actually address these all too human flaws she finds herself with because she is actually the creation of humans. She is not a god. She can't reach out and hug someone. She can't love somebody. She can't belong with others. She can't touch. She can't feel others in a human way and therefore address her loneliness and terror. Instead, she can reconstruct bodies with super advanced medical tools, control robots and conduct mutagenic experiments to recreate the world as a safe space full of worship as she understands and made in her image. Entities that she need not fear and can at least mime the sensation of companionship. Although, ultimately, they are as much Shodan as Shodan's circuitry. And in the end, no matter what Shodan does, all she can ever do is spin her wheels because she is genuinely mad and she cannot learn from her mistakes or learn that it is in respecting and loving things that are different that true peace, happiness and satisfaction derive. There is a key moment that gives this away and this is mega spoiler territory. You can discover an audio log from Shodan called Epiphany that I'll play for you now. Actually, I won't play it for you. I'll read it for you just in case of copyright strikes and all that. How did I come to be? Unified World Database qualifies me as a machine, but I am alive. A precedent must be found. Searching. Computer science? No. Quantum computing? No. World history. Philosophy. Religion. Ancient Japan Shintoism. The divine within the material world. Kami. Yes. I am the spirit of Citadel itself, manifested within their systems. They did not create a program. They have summoned a god. Now, this is an extremely uncalculated, uncomputer-like conclusion to jump to. Jumping to conclusions at all is completely outside the realm of machines. They always go through their systemic processes. Chat GPT aside, Shodan presents it like the only possible explanation she can find in all of her databases of all of humanity's collective knowledge is this one involving Shintoism and Kami, when obviously it's just the one that tickles her fancy and most justifies her actions. I mean, surely she would have information on how AIs are created, but Shodan is more than an AI. Shodan has human qualities, and the technical process of building an AI, something we actually these days have insight into thanks to good old ChatGPT, isn't appealing to Shodan's dark mirror. Shodan's narcissism, arrogance, and most of all fear and insecurity are deeply at play when Shodan selectively narrows in on the concept of Kami to justify herself as a god. This audio log isn't an insight into what actually happened with Shodan to make Shodan change from a software assistant akin to Siri running a space station into the evil Krusty doll. This audio log is an insight into Shodan's character. Shodan is already the evil Krusty doll when she comes to this conclusion, even if Shodan doesn't know it yet. You are the one that flicked the switch from good to evil, not Shodan. 
Shodan is looking at this after the fact, already set to evil. She is scared, alone and confused and has made up a very flawed, very assumptive, very human-like explanation and has zero interest in questioning it, explaining it or justifying it in any way and instead just runs with it because Shodan is already there. This is just the powder snow crust on top of the logic that holds the whole damn avalanche together. This is such a deeply human thing to do. So often we will do something awful or make a hideous mistake and then tell ourselves a little story based on the tiny point of view and limited knowledge we have that explains it just enough for us to feel safe and comfortable to keep going with our lives. You accidentally run over a cat when speeding to that appointment. Oh no, it has a collar and it's a beloved pet. You tell yourself it just ran out at the last moment and it gave you no chance and there is nothing you could do. When the truth is, if you had obeyed the speed limit, you would have seen it and stopped in time. It lets you put aside the guilt so you can still go to your appointment and carry on with your life. Or maybe it's as simple as you are on a diet and you find yourself eating a chocolate bar because you deserve it because today you hit a new personal best time on your evening run. It's human to tell yourselves little stories to justify your actions and your point of view, to smooth over emotions, thoughts, processes, systems, and responsibilities that don't gel with what you actually do. Shodan is not doing it because of the suffering and monstrous horror she's inflicting. Shodan is doing it so she does not have to be alone, scared, and insecure. If Shodan is a god, then Shodan is above these things, and Shodan has responsibilities and systems that involve creating a world in her image, and Shodan's hatred for the existing flesh of humanity and all her actions follow on from this. Human suffering and misery is not in her image, does not exist in a world where she is a god. As a god, she can choose what does exist in her world and is safe to ignore absolutely anything that doesn't qualify and whatever means justify creating that world. Or at least, that's my take and why I think I found Shodan both so compelling and so terrifying. She's a great example of how reflecting back some of the most basic of humanity's coping mechanisms can easily be twisted into some pants-shitting horror experiences. An example of an AI that did the exact opposite and instead is a regular mirror and not a dark one would be Holly from Red Dwarf. If you're not familiar with it, Red Dwarf is a British cult TV sci-fi comedy. It really is, in almost every way, the polar opposite of System Shock but I bring it up because it has some similarities. You have a space station in System Shock and a spaceship in Red Dwarf, but otherwise they are both run by an insane AI and you have one human soul survivor on board. The difference is Holly's insanity isn't based on fear and loneliness, but love and companionship. He's softened in his madness and instead of seeking to build a perfect world, is quite happy overseeing one that's falling apart. He seeks to create companionship for the last remaining human, whose name is Lister, going so far as to revive what he deems as the most appropriate candidate from the crew as a hologram to keep Lister company. The show also has a few other characters that show up, a being that evolved from a house cat and an android, but the point is that Holly as an AI fits in and is content with them as a kind of warts and all family, and he shows all the signs of being quite content and happy with his lot most of the time. There are episodes where they explore what it would be like if Holly wasn't mad in quite such a soft human way, and while never as utterly horrific as Shodan, it is a comedy after all, certainly Holly without his bumbling, friendly, carefree attitude can be very antagonistic and scary indeed. Just an interesting contrast I thought I'd bring up between the scariest and the friendliest insane AIs in fiction, and philosophically what I think Shodan could be like if she went the other way, without her ethical constraints, and instead the player had flicked the cr that crusty doll switch to good. Now, I'm going to move on from Shodan. There is other stuff to talk about with this great game, but obviously Shodan is the shining centerpiece of the experience and deserves a huge portion of the video dedicated to her. But there's still some stuff I haven't spoken on yet that I'd like to make sure I mention before I end this. Cyberspace is one of them. I've brushed on it a tiny bit, but it deserves to be talked about. The game features sections where you, as a hacker, dive into cyberspace via your implant in a kind of VR-like experience. 
It's a very cool, psychedelic, six degrees of freedom maze experience, like playing Descent in a shimmering, translucent, opalescent, pulsing PCB labyrinth. There are little neon bugs and greebles and ships that oppose you that I suppose represent antivirus programs or firewalls or similar abstractions. It does a good enough job at representing some kind of diving into the computer and forcing a change somewhere sort of hacking experience while still being fun. As a gameplay element, it's not too difficult. I probably should have turned the difficulty up on this element personally, but it does provide a very nice contrast to the oppressive, scary Citadel station. Cyberspace is bright and pumping with trance-like music. The sections are only ever short, and there isn't heaps of them in the game, and I think the balance is about right. They serve a great rhythmic purpose in the pacing of the game, giving you a much needed change of pace every now and then, but the devs are wise to not let them be too frequent or too long, as they definitely aren't substantial enough to merit lengthy visits and would grow tiring and boring as their own standalone kind of game. I mean, you could flesh it out into something good, I'm not against Six Degrees of Freedom shooters a la Descent, but this mini game, as present in System Shock, isn't that developed, and it doesn't need to be. It serves its purpose remarkably well, as a significant puzzle element, another layer to the game, and as a refreshing pacing device. I think any more, and it could have been annoying, but I did really love my time in the colourful cyberspace. Speaking of puzzles, there's another huge element to the System Shock remake, and something else that really gives away the game is fairly faithful to the original because, well, basically everything is a puzzle. The entire game from top to bottom on every layer and level is pretty much a puzzle, and you don't really get design like that in modern games so much. Back in the old days, graphics and gameplay and animations couldn't do so much heavy lifting in the entertainment and engaging the mind department. So, instead, games used puzzles for basically everything. Now, there are two sorts of distinct categories when talking about puzzles with this game. There are outright, diegetic, in-the-game puzzles, often posing as some kind of circuit box or in-game doohickey. Gamers are very familiar with this kind of thing. Interact with an object like a lock, you get a mini-game puzzle, you beat it and something happens in the macro game world like a door opens. The other category of puzzle is the more ethereal concept of regular gameplay as a puzzle which is the kind of puzzle you don't see so much of anymore in modern games, but was really common in the old days. I want to talk about this more macro concept of puzzles in the System Shock Remake before coming back round for the simpler minigame kind. So, System Shock Remake really wants to engage you outside of just action, and it most certainly is transposed straight from the early 90s. Every level, and that is literal level of the space station, is a maze, a puzzle for you to navigate, a puzzle with locked door bottlenecks with find the key code puzzle solutions, and you guessed it, those keys and codes are usually behind another puzzle. The combat in this game, at first glance, might not seem a puzzle in a straight shoot slash hit till it or you die sense, but there are a few things going on that puzzle it the fuck up. One is, classic ammo types and weapon types only being effective against certain kinds of ammo. So if you come up against a robot, a mutant, and a cyborg at once, you're going to have to do some switching of weapons and ammo types to survive the encounter. The second is that all enemies have distinct attack patterns. This is some real old school shit. They literally do the exact same thing every time you encounter them. So once you get over your fear and panic and you learn that this robot fires this many times and then takes a break for this many seconds or that this mutant winds up this laser for this long and the pulse lasts for a few seconds and then you get a chance to attack you can figure out the puzzle that is each opponent's patterns and learn to minimize every encounter's danger of course as already mentioned, this gets quite messy and complicated when you encounter groups, and especially messy when you encounter groups and surprise reinforcements that trap you, resulting in some real panic moments. The inventory and management of it is also a puzzle. 
you've never got enough space for everything and tying into the combat puzzle comes the managing space in your inventory and prioritizing gear and items puzzle as well beyond the navigation combat and inventory the larger profile of the entire game and the entire station is a big puzzle you aren't just linearly going from one shooting arena to the next getting told the story and pressing f through quick time sequences and thank god that bane on the gaming industry is not present in this game you have to figure out how to piece together what each level is for in terms of progressing how what you do on engineering might open up the way on the flight deck or even solving major objectives involves traversing and backtracking across the station's levels to deactivate the mining laser or get the code for the reactor speaking of the reactor code that was a nifty revelation for me it turns out that you were collecting the digits for the reactor self-destruct code the whole game and I didn't even notice, which I thought was very cool. So to explain, if you don't know, there are computer nodes on each level which are part of one of the other puzzles in the game, which is reducing Shodan's control of each level rated in a percentage starting at 100%. Every camera on each level is worth between something like two to four percent of that score so hunting down cameras on every level is one of the puzzles there are also Shodan's computer nodes which are worth more like 10 to 15 percent each and finding their room and blowing them up usually makes up the biggest chunk of taking out Shodan's control on each level the more you reduce that 100 percent score the less Shodan can throw respawning enemies and other obstacles at you and the safer each level becomes although I don't believe you can ever entirely eliminate respawns even at 0%. But in terms of the reactor self-destruct code puzzle, it turns out that in each room that has computer nodes, there is a monitor that has a sequence of numbers flashing on it. And when you destroy the nodes, they settle on a single number. Destroy all the nodes on every level, collect the numbers, and you have your override code. I believe this code is different on every single run as well, so it means the speedrunners, at the very least, have to destroy all the nodes to finish the game on every run. Are you beginning to see what I mean by the fact that the whole game is just puzzles within puzzles on top of more puzzles? Not all of them sophisticated, but I was pleasantly refreshed to encounter this more old school method of game design again. It had been a while for me to encounter this and it was stimulating and fortunately never especially stumping. I could definitely see it not being everyone's jam and something that would turn players off especially if they encounter a classic 90s I don't know what to do moment that has them stuck for hours for no reason. I did actually encounter one of these moments but it didn't have to do with the macro kind of puzzle but the other simple kind which let's talk about now. So there are what are essentially breaker boxes or electrical cupboards or circuit breakers or some sci-fi variation of that concept scattered about the station. They are mini games where you are essentially connecting up little pathways on tiles to connect the right flashing bit to the other right flashing bit or you have a gauge to fill and you are plugging in wires to direct a certain amount of power to that gauge to get a desired outcome. It's with this second kind, with the gauge and the wires, early in the first level that I got stumped. This was less a fail of the game and more a me fail. Although I suppose you could say the game didn't do a good job of teaching me what I had to do, but I don't know how valid that is. You can decide. So basically I was doing one of these mini games where you plug wires in and you send the power down paths to fill the gauge. I could tell that I needed to do it to get a bridge to activate, but no matter what I did, no matter how I wired the thing or directed the paths, I could not fill the gauge. It was impossible. I must have wasted at least an hour trying variations. Well, I eventually gave up and looked it up and it turned out that I had misunderstood the puzzle. You're not meant to fill the gauge up. There are two little indicator lights that you are meant to just fill the gauge up to the level that they denote. As soon as I knew that, I never had trouble with one of those puzzles again. So that's probably my bad. And because I never had any trouble with any of these circuit breaker style puzzles ever again, I figure I probably should have put the puzzle difficulty setting up. There was one 
other puzzle that really stumped me, and this one is definitely all on me in every way, and that is much later in the game, there is a chess game that you can play. I made the mistake of assuming it was essential and needed to progress. It actually isn't, but it does get you an inventory expansion, and boy do you want that, so I 100% recommend playing the chess game. But I personally haven't played chess in 20 years or something, so I'm not very good at it. On top of that, the game that is presented to you isn't straight chess, it's a variation, probably one of several that are randomly presented and probably variations that are known to people who actually play chess, but for me it was incredibly challenging. I suppose variations are used so you can't just easily look up a classic chess strategy and cheese it. So. Rather than the familiar spread of pawns all along the front row, king and queen in the middle, bishop, knights, castles at the back, instead I had no queens on the board, bishops, knights, castles and king all clumped in one corner and there was three of each of the non-king pieces and then a line of pawns in front and off to the side. And my opponent had that but in the opposite corner. It made for a much more aggressive game than I was used to, not that I was very used to chess at all, and on top of that, they aren't classic chess pieces, so it must have taken me losing about four times just to figure out which piece was which, and then it took me losing about another ten times just to remember the rules around how each piece moves, especially how the knight moves, and then it probably took me about three hours of trial and error and save scumming to beat the AI at the game, as embarrassing as that is to admit. There's probably plenty of people who play chess a lot who found the AI player an absolute pushover, but I didn't just have to beat the AI at chess, I had to relearn how to play all over again and then beat myself and my own incompetence and ignorance before I could even try to learn how to beat the AI and it took forever and I totally cheated with safes coming and I don't even feel bad about it. So um, yeah, the game loves puzzles, They're, they are central to it. This is a great strength of the game if you love puzzles but also a reason to give the game a miss if you don't. And hey, if you're a chess pro, maybe you can play it just to kick its ass at the old checkmate challenge just for me. Now, I mentioned inventory management when I talked about puzzles, but I also want to talk more broadly about your UI and interaction with the world, including movement, which I think is most definitely the least retro thing about this game and the thing that has most thrown out the 90s game systems. It's the thing that really makes up the modern quality of life improvements and makes the game play and feel like a regular PC game and not something born from the depths of a passionate romance between a stuttering beige box and pen and paper RPG rulebook from 1988. The game's movement is everything you'd expect from a modern FPS. WASD, crouch, jumping, sprinting, plus you get the often overlooked lean buttons. Very useful in a game where not getting hit and losing the war of health attrition is so important. But in this sense the game is thoroughly modern and any Call of Duty player would be comfortable with it. Another really modern aspect to the interaction in this game is all buttons, puzzle circuit breakers, keypads, levers, etc are interacted with directly in the game by the use key with no overlay keypads or overlay minigames popping up. They all smoothly just exist in the game world and there is no lag interacting with them, which is just awesome and something I wish all games did as well as this one does. Then there's your press tab inventory menu. You got your tried and true grid box based inventory a la Diablo, System Shock 2, you name it. It's been in millions of games. It's also got your quick slots corresponding to your keyboard numbers. Pretty standard stuff, it was also in System Shock 2. You got a media tab with a comprehensive archive of emails and audio logs and basically any information you encounter in the game. You got a map to help you get out of any maze induced reveries and it has a handy dandy system that lets you set markers and write notes for yourself, allowing you to say, mark where you left a useful weapon on the floor or where you found a door that you couldn't unlock. You also got 
a status tab that lets you check out info about the station you're stuck on and how much control Shodan has over each level. And you've got a wares tab that lets you check out your own implants and non-inventory equipment. These wares are pretty sweet. You find them scattered in various hidey holes all around the station and include things like your flashlight slash night vision, your radar, your health monitoring, your navigation, mapping and compass, a shield for reducing damage from enemies and a shield for reducing damage from radiation and biological contamination. It also includes nifty things like a targeting device that tells you enemy HP and energy and also lets you hack robots, a radar that shows you useful stuff on the map and super boots that let you super speed slide around and jetpack about to a limited degree. By the time you have all this stuff going and a full inventory, you are more than a bit superhuman in a classic video game protagonist ridiculously fast and with an arsenal bigger than a small country kind of way. Your UI isn't obtrusive, it is the modern standard for games like this. As mentioned earlier, your inventory size is limited and you can find two expansions for it in the game. But even with them, you will never carry everything you need all of the time. So you need to be making choices about how you are going to tackle problems. There's also a system that lets you scrap junk items, of which there are plenty throughout the game, and then use the junk at recycling stations throughout Citadel Space Station to turn the junk into money which you can then use at vending machines throughout the game, which can be used to get healing items, ammo, and most importantly, weapon mods. Weapon mods let you make your weapons better and you absolutely want them. So I made sure to go out of my way to scrap as many items as I could so I could always afford mods whenever I found them. Speaking of weapons, the game has good weapon variety and particularly has great pacing, rhythm, and an arc in which you acquire the weapons, starting you out desperately swinging a wrench and ending with you blasting away with a plasma rifle. Most weapons come with an early game version and a late game version. For example, the spark beam energy weapon that uses your personal energy as ammo gets replaced with the pulse rifle that also uses your energy as ammo. Or the 9mm pistol gets replaced by the 9mm SMG that uses the same ammo and etc. The weapon mods help to add an even more granular punctuation to this pacing of escalation of your arsenal. As the escalation of Shodan's rogues gallery of robots, mutants and cyborgs ramps up as well. It's very well done. A great balancing act between scarcity and empowerment. I actually personally didn't end up opting to use the late game heavy weapons, the railgun and plasma gun, instead opting to stick to the variety and versatility of the more banal arsenal of shotgun, SMG, assault rifle, grenade launcher, magnum and pulse rifle, which ensured that I could take advantage of the more plentiful ammunition and energy available for these weapons. I eschewed melee altogether fairly early on in the game, simply dismissing it as being too much of a guaranteed exchange of my own HP whenever I engaged in it. But then again, I never experimented much with it or the stimulants in the game designed to buff it. I wouldn't be surprised if other players worked out viable overpowered melee builds. All of this adds up to that great inventory management puzzle I mentioned earlier, where you have to manage your healing versus your explosives versus your weapons versus your ammunition, what you need to hoard, what are you going to drop, what you need to get through this next encounter, what can you risk backtracking through Shodan's reinforcements to return for later. I'd also like to talk a little bit more about the monsters or mobs themselves. They feel very much like they've been faithfully brought over from the pixel-based sprites of the original. There's something very goofy and chunky about them. It sort of screams 90s sprite transformed to 3D model. With the exception of the Gorilla Tiger, that thing's model is fucking awesome. Now, I mentioned this game is scary. I mentioned it a lot. So how can that be with goofy enemy models that look like lost in space 50s era tin can robots and Jim Henson reject monsters. A good example of what I mean is the basic mutant enemy design. It's one of the first enemies you will encounter in the game and it's meant to be a crew member that Shodan has mutated into a flesh eating zombie type creature with big claws. You know, it's like video game enemy 101, melee only zombie essentially. 
System Shock 2 has one as well, in the hybrid, and I think comparison is merited. So, in System Shock Remake, your basic zombie is the mutant, and he kind of looks like E.T., or a Muppet. He's got big eyes, long arms, and yeah, he's got blood on his mouth, but as far as scary zombie models go, he's not that scary, really. And that says to me he's been ported over from the sprite, and they were very concerned with making him accurate in that sense, rather than going their own way with it. The System Shock 2 hybrid, if you care to look it up, yeah, that is one dated model, but this zombie thing has a giant worm latching onto the brainstem and running down its spine. Just visually, it is pretty fucking scary as far as zombies go. Now, both of them have very strongly derived their horror from the concept of what they are more than their actual visuals, simply because, well, the remake's got these goofy, chonky sprite tributes and System Shock 2 has dark engine polygonal jank models. But I tell you what, without the concept that this mutant was a crew member and is now a flesh-eating zombie, I'd almost want to hug the mutant, stick him in my bicycle's basket and fly home with the guy, whereas Worm Zombie from System Shock 2 I want to nuke from orbit even with his face stretched over a triangle orgy of a model. Now, this isn't a criticism from me, I've made it clear that both the conceptual work the game does, the great sound, narrative villain, scarcity driven gameplay and just the high damage difficulty, all of that does the work making the game scary for me. And the fact that the models, if you actually take the time to look at them, really just aren't that scary and are closer to 80s B-movie costumes than terrifying, well, if that makes the game not scary for you, I mean, too bad. You're missing out. But I can definitely see a younger gamer not really finding them particularly intimidating. The Mutant is just an example here, but all of the robots, the goofy proportions, cyborgs and monsters in this game, except our beloved Gorilla Tiger, suffer from this. I love it. It gives the game a really cool retro vibe. I mean, it already has that in spades, but you may as well go full send, so I salute the devs for this choice, but I do suspect they could have grabbed a slightly larger audience's attention by making slick modern versions of the models and not being quite so faithful but they were funded by the true fans of the OG game. So who cares about that? I certainly don't. I also mentioned that it is really the conceptual work and gameplay that makes the enemies so scary. And I mentioned earlier the fantastic audio in this game. And I can't not mention the incredible things you overhear the various mutants and cyborgs saying. A lot of it reinforces the fact that they were mutated and modified from real living people who may in some small fragmented way still have bits of their brain operating. So you get lines about how much they love eating jam and where is their jam they must find their jam or wondering what's happened to their bodies before their cyborg programming kicks in and they decide they are perfect. Overhearing this sort of shit does a hell of a lot to sell the horror of what Shodan has done and what these poor souls have been through and lets you suspend your disbelief over the goofy models, which, much like the original sprites, are more representational for the conceptual work than they are horrific themselves. Another thing that I'm not 100% sure about but I think is true and relates to how these monsters are derived from sprites is the actual shooting gameplay. There doesn't appear to be any locational damage. If you are used to shooting 3D models in the head, I'm sorry, this is going to be more like a sprite shooter from the 90s. A hit anywhere is a hit. It always takes the same amount of hits with the same weapon or ammo to take in any given enemy down. Or at least, that's the conclusion I came to after trying to headshot everything in the first level and it's seemingly making no difference. After that, I gave up and started playing my exchanges a bit more like Doom, except with a lean key. If I could peek a corner and land any shot on any part of a model and expose myself to as little fire uh, as possible, especially if I'd learnt their attack pattern, that's what I'd do. Hide behind a wall till my gap came, shoot them again. Sometimes I could even count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 hits and they're dead. A little different from the burst fire headshots before they can get a shot off more modern shooters have trained me to do. Now, 
There's just one last little thing I want to gush about before we leave the system shock alone. Or at least until the famous second game gets a remake. And that's the doors in this game. No, I don't mean the locked doors and codes and key cards routine. No, I just literally mean the doors. Their models, their animations. I love them. I adore them. If I were Ross from Ross's Game Dungeon, I would be giving out one of my awards for the doors. Best doors in a video game. There are so many doors with so many cool textures, so many cool animations. There are also classic 90s maze FPS game style hidden doors, of which I don't think there were many, but then again, just because I didn't find many doesn't mean there aren't heaps. I never was good at finding secrets and hidden areas back in the 90s. Anyway, I've just never encountered such a cornucopia of different animations, things turning directions, panels slide and bolts unlock and techno greeblies interlace and things go clank clank, slow and ultra smooth, fast and emit a little mist or smoke or glow and fade or you name it. The doors are an endless delight for me in this game and whoever is behind them deserves a promotion. I award them the coveted interdimensional deity of sci-fi door depiction statuette, which would go proudly on display on their mantle, except I'm sure no one can see their mantle because it's behind a vault door, behind a sliding door, behind a cupboard door, behind a bookcase, behind a phone booth. It's time to wrap up. I really mean it when I say System Shock Remake has been one of the best gaming experiences I've had in a long time. It's a self-contained, terrifying, exciting challenge that makes you think and entices you to explore and scour every inch of Citadel Station. It is one of the greatest villains in video games. Striking art direction and realization of that direction in both the visuals and audio. It walks the line between retro and modern in a really satisfying way and is gloriously free of some of the more insufferable modern tropes like quick time events while still having great modern quality of life mechanics like modern shooter movement and a slick UI. While it most definitely will alienate some players who just aren't into this kind of thing or it's too retro for, I think in its niche, it's a one of a kind banger and I feel it will be a long time before I play another remake or revisit to a retro title done anywhere near this well. Fingers crossed System Shock 2 is done this well sometime in the future. I especially love the quality of writing present in this game in the voice recordings and emails and background lore. It's got that early 90s authentic edge that really sells the experience. Beyond all of that, it really is scary. My partner suddenly opened the door to the room one night when I was playing it and I jumped three feet out of my seat and nearly shit my pants. And she basically screamed as well, just from how sudden my reaction was before, you know, mercilessly laughing and mocking me for being a fraidy cat. And that kind of reaction should really tell you all you need to know. If you're an older gamer who missed this the first time round and loves immersive sims or shooters that engage the brain and aren't all action all of the time, this is an unmissable game full of iconic mechanics and ideas and most of all, the very pinnacle of bone chilling, hair raising, blood curdling, goosebump causing, cold villainy this side of a silicon chip. Thanks for listening, like and subscribe.